This is a News Laundry podcast and you're listening to NL Conversations. Hello and welcome to News Laundry. On January 14th, a verdict came out that Franco Mulakal, Bishop Franco Mulakal was acquitted. A single line verdict was given by the district court in Kotiam. This acquittal comes four years after an FIR alleging rape was filed against him by a nun in Kotiam who worked under the Missionaries of Jesus Convent. In her allegation, she said that she had been raped 13 times by this particular bishop from the time period of 2014 to 2016. She said that multiple times she had approached the church to try and file a complaint against him, but she was ignored and no action was taken. After which, in 2018, she went ahead and filed a complaint at a police station in Kotem. Investigation was started and five nuns from within the convent actually came out in support of her. And it is important to understand that for a nun to speak up against a bishop is not an easy challenge and is almost like going against the church. So when these five nuns came out in support, there was massive protests in Kerala for and against these nuns. Finally, after over 100 days of hearing, Franco Mulakal was acquitted in a single line verdict in the court. The judgment is almost 289 pages and goes into like goes into a lot of detail about the victim's version as well as the power dynamic within the church. But finally, the verdict reads that Franco Mulakal is acquitted, citing lack of evidence. Today with me is Advocate Sandhya Raju, who's on the panel of advocates who are representing the surviving nun. We're going to take a look at what the judgment actually means and the implications it has for victims of sexual harassment or survivors of sexual harassment. Welcome, Sandhya. And uh, I actually want to start by asking you if you could take me back to the evening of January 13th, the day before the verdict came out. Um, if you could tell me a little bit about what was the atmosphere among the lawyers, you know, what were the what was the survivor thinking? What would happen the next day? What was the talk? Actually, the way the trial had gone about and way, uh, the, in the manner in which most of the witnesses, all the witnesses who had whom we had reduced actually uh, remained, uh, uh, you know, st- uh, where, uh, where did not turn any of them, none of them turned hostile. We were actually quite positive about the judgment, all of us, uh, though, uh, like, you know, we're just uh, fingers crossed. It was more like a fingers crossed kind of thing and uh, hoping for a positive outcome because she had said everything what was required. Right. And the next day when the verdict came out, you were in court. And, you know, what was the initial reaction? What what did talk? Total, absolute shock because uh, uh, we were uh, hoping for a conviction. However, like, you know, it may not have been a life imprisonment. We were uh, 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 not looking at that as such, but we were looking for a conviction for rape. But this was a total, absolute shock where he is acquitted. It was like uh, we were all stunned, basically. Everyone. I mean, the whole whole courtroom was stunned, actually. And was the survivor in court? Like, no, and what no, no. The survivor down? has been totally closeted inside her convent from the time she has filed the FIR. And, you know, that after that initial investigation process, whatever, she's not come out in the public at all. So this is, this judgment is actually now going to push her back further inside, you know, into, um, into being closeted. I mean, it's very difficult for her to come out as such now. And what about outside the courtroom when the verdict was given and you came out? Like, what was the mood outside? Defense side was jubilant. I mean, you had uh, garlands being placed on uh, the bishop and uh, ladoos being distributed all over and uh, um, all that. There was this huge crowd there. Uh, uh, and news, I mean, yeah, yeah, news, uh, the media people. Uh, uh, trying to get a word but um, the people outside general public I feel uh, they were all stunned I mean they're like you know they were quite shocked as to I mean I felt they were quite shocked as to the kind of judgment and when we spoke on 14 January uh, you had I think just stepped out of court and you said it was a single line verdict the uh, uh, judge pretty much just said that he's acquitted um, when you did read uh, the judgment which is over 200 pages what were your first impressions? What did you uh, immediately think? Four of her, it was a judgment uh, which was uh, drafted or uh, prepared without really going into the existing current legal principles on sexual assault, which has been, and especially 
totally foregoing the progressive principles which have been laid down by the supreme court and the amendment which has been passed by the uh, you know parliament post nirbhaya that is the 2013 criminal amendment uh, the definition of rape itself has gone a, has undergone a massive change all that was kind of totally uh, overlooked and uh, Uh, there were it was more of looking at means it seemed like a uh, a way of trying to acquit this acquit this accused in uh, you know look at reasons for acquitting the accused rather than uh, providing justice to the survivor is what i felt right and in the uh, in the judgment one thing that really stands out is how the judgment has questioned the credibility of her statement by citing inconsistencies and said that multiple times you know she hasn't said that there was penile um, intercourse and that she's only mentioned about sharing a bed so she's been inconsistent about these things um what do you think the court is referring to when they mean by inconsistencies and how does that really define her credibility because ultimately the judgment says that she is not a credible person to give a statement i feel uh, it was more of a play of words what was happening there uh, to kind of determine whether there was credibility or not because i don't find any difference between sharing a bed uh, sharing a bed uh, obviously it was not a platonic sharing of bed so when she saying uh, he would ask me to share a bed with him this mean that there is going to be some kind of um, sexual interaction happening and uh, penile penetration it, it is um, she may not have said penile penetration but look at it i mean like people like us uh, as uh, people like us also are not going to very openly talk about something like that i mean you know it's not easy for we we're not trained we we are not used to talking about things like this so so when we in the outside world find it very difficult to even voice these uh, words these specific words uh, she was trying uh, how can you expect a nun who has been closeted in a convent for the pa- from the age of 15 to actually talk about these words you know um, because uh, when you're talking about sexual assault it's even um, if someone um, pinches your bum uh for the girl it is traumatic and she is not going to immediately go file a police complaint or you know she'll even she, she, she what she'll try to do is to you know just see what is happening i mean a, a, a norm a, an ordinary person who is not really um you know very bold enough she'll try to move away rather than you know trying to confront the accused so this is what she was doing and uh, Uh, considering the church uh, power dynamics she was totally and she who uh, and uh, power dynamics and nuns are supposed to be uh, they take the vow of obedience and chastity something like this has was la- devastating for her so uh, it it was like uh, how do i deal with it you know that is the whole question which she would have been going through the trauma she was going through so for her to even talk about this or voice these concerns uh, or write it down i feel would have been so difficult and even then she has been saying i mean like that's what i was telling uh, i i was saying harassment by the bishop is so loaded for her that word harassment would have been so loaded for her because there's so much so much of those events culminating in the word harassment whereas uh, for uh, someone like the judge he wanted some more detail you know he wanted specific clear cut and dry words which is not easy for a person to actually say so um, there has been a this... the statement she's given in 164 i believe which is it has very clearly explained all kind of the end it's not this it took almost 8 hours for her to record the 164 statement you know and she has uh, it was a traumatic experience traumatic in the way she was reliving that entire incident uh, so just imagine she is spoken about she she very clearly graphically described whatever she could as best as she could so it was up to the authorities to actually look at it in an empathetic manner and kind of uh, um understand you know go go beyond the stated words also i mean you know you don't you, you need not just rely on very exact words which had been 
stated and she it's very and the thing is she's not it is not as if that uh, um, pina it's not just penile penetration there was the, like the the ingredients of rape as such was all there Uh, so it's not as if that uh, just because there was i mean even if you're saying um, there was penile penetration that was there but just because she did not mention it very clearly does not mean that it was not there you know so it's it's like you you can't possibly detail everything to and to everyone to all and sundry i mean you know you can't really say that also it's 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 I mean, it's going to so many people so she would have been embarrassed to actually talk about it also um what's interesting in the judgment is that there's a large section that's actually dedicated to talking about power and lust and kind of establishes his authority over uh, her and what it means to be a bishop what it means to be a nun um but eventually the verdict goes on to say that he's acquitted um why do you, and in it's kind of confusing because when you read the judgment it seems fairly progressive into how much detail they've gone to establish his authority over her uh, what do you think uh, happened why, why was that not taken into context at all it was the dutch why it was not taken into context at all uh, because uh, uh, if uh, you know that particular uh, uh, that particular explanation would have very much justified him getting at least minimum 5 years imprisonment because of the power dynamics involved and the sexual assault happening on account of the power dynamics so based on that itself a conviction of 5 years was um, he was eligible so from there he is going straight away to acquittal means uh, the judge uh, did not really appreciate or did not really uh, take into context the kind of uh, i mean like it's all good to say but uh, understand the power dynamics there or to see how much it can you know lead to yeah it's also interesting that the judgment doesn't exactly prove him to be innocent it literally cites lack of evidence right is that something that will be considered at the high court level when it goes definitely uh, see the thing is you uh, uh if a person has to be acquitted you just need to show that there is not i mean it doesn't mean that he is not guilty uh, it's just that there is no evidence i mean that's how uh, 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 that's how uh, the criminal trial works so a criminal so here uh, that's what's happened uh, but the thing is uh, there was there were enough instances if the judge had used his discretion properly Uh, i feel there were enough instances where he could have been convicted but he preferred not to use those discretions right another section in the that the judgment has dedicated itself to quite a bit is uh, the fir filed by the cousin of the survivor uh, just to give a bit of a context to our viewers there was uh, the survivor had a cousin who filed a complaint against the survivor saying that she had an illicit affair uh, with her husband that is the cousin's husband um and eventually actually the cousin came forward and said that this was a false complaint but what the judgment does is uh, goes into great detail as to uh, trying to explain this cousin's uh, complaint against the survivor now uh, what i want to ask you is what are the repercussions that the survivor has had because of this complaint and how do you think the judgment has actually treated now here we have two women giving statements right one is the cousin and uh, who's making the complaint against the survivor and one is the survivor who's making a complaint against franco uh, mulakel how do you think the judgment has treated the statements made by the two women so the thing is um, the statement made by uh, her cousin was taken as sacrosanct despite her saying that it's a false complaint i mean it was like you know made in a fit of anger it was fake or it was uh, fraudulent and she had certain issues so she had it was a false complaint just to kind of get back at the sister uh, but that was not really taken into account by the judge and was saying that uh, and he tried to justify for not taking that into account um and uh, if whereas here you have the uh, sister or the nun very clearly saying that she was sexually assaulted um her words were not at all given credibility so there is definitely a uh, you know a unequal uh, uh, there's been like you know the, the, these two people were treated in a very unequal manner 
and uh, the uh, the statement the prosecution the 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 victim or the survivor none was actually uh, he he really did not uh, i would say uh, respect i uh, or he did not give her the kind of uh, uh, respect and empathy which was supposed to be given to a sexual assault victim um, and it was clearly uh, she was seen as some person trying to you know um, attack the bishop it was seen more like that more of a revenge kind of thing uh by the uh, revenge or revenge or what do you say it was more like you know trying to who's trying to kind of create problems with the church and things like that she was seen more like an individual like that uh, and uh, with respect to the complaint i mean i don't really think how relevant it is also because uh, here how does a past character of a, of an individual really Uh, determine uh, whether she should be believed or not here in the sense because here i here she is saying that i have been assaulted and here uh, you are relying on some person's fake statement saying that okay this ca- character and conduct of the nun uh, of the survivor not nun is not proper so we can't really believe her statement i mean how does that even come i mean if you look at it even a sex worker if she says no it means no absolutely you know and here this throughout the judgment the judgment also talks about her broken hymen how does that even affect or should impact her judgment i mean the where she says ki i did not consent to the uh, invasion of privacy or the sexual assault by the bishop the person in concerned is the bishop not the cousin or a husband that's a totally different thing and how does that even come into the how does that even come into the picture even assuming like let's say if there could have been some way which is not there at all total here the here this was a case where this um, husband of the cousin tried to uh, send uh, some messages which she objected to and she immediately like a sister forwarded to her sister, cousin saying that see your husband is sending me these messages please ask him to stop but this lady decides um, i must have heard from but uh, uh, must have decided uh, or something because she had certain issues she files a complaint to the convent to teach her her lesson teach the sister her lesson i mean that was a context right that was a context but that was not really that context was explained and that was also um, um in the 164 also it was explained but that was the judge refused to you know over, uh, kind of consider that so um, it's more of like you know trying to uh, judge the big survivor none throughout for her daring to accuse a bishop of sexual assault it was more like that it also talks a lot about the delay uh, of her filing the complaint and that seems to have been something that has um yeah so delay in filing on of f and fir in a regular case is definitely uh, shows or towards it 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 points towards uh, you know uh, lesser believability of a case but the thing is there has there's been recent supreme court judgments where delay is especially in sexual assault cases should not be a consideration because of the nature of the crime because sexual assault of the nature of the stigma or involved and the nature of uh, the emotional trauma a woman undergoes uh, it is very natural for her to keep quiet about it and you know only when she i mean there are you, we have survivors who kind of even after 14 15 years of sexual assault have not have not able to come out and talk about it you know and here she has it, it's it's it took around 3 years to i mean uh, even 3 years to talk about it only because she got support from her sister, from her companion sister the other nuns otherwise she would not even have come out uh, or spoken about it also you know so it's only when she got the support from her other sister nuns that she actually came out otherwise she would not have come out and for all you know she would have been a sad statistic for all you know we never know i mean we have uh, you know in uh, kerala uh, in the past one year uh, past two years you've had 26 
suicides of nuns. 26 suicides of nuns. So what does it indicate? I'm not saying that, you know, there could be sexual assault or whatever. There's serious mental health issue. And that's, that's because of the condition in the end, in the environment of the convent system, right? So what this nun survivor, nun has gone through is also something very close to, she, she would have committed suicide also. I mean, that's, she had, she's also mentioned that. She's, yeah, she has mentioned that also because she, there was no way, there was no outlet. And when she got this group of sisters who were willing to listen to her, she opened up and that also only after she went for a confession and she got strength through prayer and then those sisters, they pray, uh, kind of uh, pushed her to kind of speak about why she was upset and that's how she came out of it. And then when they were there to help her, she got some kind of strength, you know, and that's so important for a sexual assault survivor. And she was slowly trying to gain her foothold and trying to get her confidence. And now this judgment has really pushed her back. So it also it's, the it's, delay, uh, um, it refers to the delay in filing a police complaint. But from my understanding, she's actually complained multiple times within the church as well. Yeah, yeah, definitely. It, it's more, it's more like uh, from the time, uh, from the time she got the confidence enough to speak out and she had the support, she started making representations, and the church refused to look at it. They didn't want to kind of touch the bishop. They say, okay, we'll see, we'll do, we'll, let's see, or whatever. And this is does not come under our jurisdiction. They were not forthcoming at all, you know. So um, this is something. Uh, the church will have to introspect, I feel. It definitely will have to introspect because just because this case has, uh, 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 he got acquitted in this particular case doesn't mean that he's not guilty. It doesn't mean that he's not guilty and her, she will definitely, uh, the fact is that we still have the other uh, higher options to go and we will be uh, going for that. Uh, but uh, the fact is that the church will have to look, think about how are they going to make these spaces safe for the women, uh, the other survivor nun, other nuns who are there, you know, uh, will they have an internal complaints committee to deal with these issues and things like that, because it's a totally different world. The, the, the convent system or the church authorities, it's a totally different world, totally cut off from the mainstream world. And if they don't have some kind of, uh, uh, you know, process, you'll have more of um, suicides happening. Hmm. Hmm. Another, uh, and I quote from the judgment, it says, quote, apart from the testimony of PW1, which is prosecution witness one, who is this, which is the survivor here, there is no corroborative evidence to prove the prosecution's case, unquote. Um, can you explain this a little bit? Because from my understanding, there was an allegation, another allegation made against the bishop, uh, where the victim said that he made very perverse, sexually perverse statements uh, online and also forcibly kissed her on the forehead. Um, how did that not form part of uh, the evidence? Yeah, so, so basically, it's not as if that there was no corroborative testimony. The fact that uh, there was a witness who actually testified is uh, part of the evidence. The other witnesses uh, whom she disclosed to are also corroborative witnesses because they substantiated what she said. So it's not as if that there was no witnesses. It's just that the judge refused to, uh, wanted something more, which unfortunately was not there. And, you know, this case started almost four years ago. Um, between the time that a case begins and a trial goes on and, you know, a verdict comes out, there's also a process that the survivor goes through during that time. Now, apart from the trauma of the incident, there's also this in-waiting process. Um, can you tell me a little bit, since you've interacted with the survivor you've, or you know her, um, what what has her life become in the last four years? You know, And also the five nuns who came out uh, in support of her, I'm sure... It's also taken a toll on them. What what is what is their life been in the last? Four years? It, it, it's 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 like they were totally closeted in the nun uh, in inside that convent uh, with police protection. Uh, that was their life for these past four years. Uh, there was enough. I mean, there was family pressures for them to kind of. There was family pressures among the sisters. Um, mm -hmm. Some for some of them. 
uh, to kind of you know not support the sister to come out and be because they had actually the objective was to become a nun and not to be part of this there was so these sisters besides the survivor nun the other sisters were also grappling with family pressures and struggles but they withheld and um, sub, it's like um, uh, family uh, family support was a major support for them mm. um, except for uh, one or two of them and uh, one of two one or two of the sisters that family support was missing so it was emotionally quite a roller coaster for them as a support group we uh, actually uh, i mean like you know we created there was uh, we created a support group for them uh, where we are constantly interacting with them and trying to keep their uh, you know morale high during the trial process so including the prosecution lawyers and then other you know ngo groups that other a group of uh, christian uh, women Uh, who had come together the christian women are all uh, like you know uh, senior people who were very active in the church and part of the church uh, um, constitution you know um, the women's uh, women cell of the church i mean they all of them came together and tried to give them emotional support and you know solidarity and things like that so that's how we tried to kind of keep them together okay. um yeah lastly uh, i want to know uh, how did the survivor take the news like what did what was her reaction she took it very stoically but she was very upset it was heartbreaking for her uh, she said so oh, we'll go on appeal uh, but it is like you know what she she's like, like she was i'm sure she must be wondering what happened why did this happen and uh, uh, all those internal struggles will be there in her mind but on the face of it in front of the people she put on a very bold face yeah very stoically she uh, Franco Molecule is a free man uh, at least until it goes to appeal and you know whatever happens next but does he now uh, have the authority to come back to the uh, convent where uh, this sister is will she continue to have police protection uh, will she be will she have to be again in an environment with him what 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 where does that stand still is the bishop he still is the administrator of the diocese um we he still can control uh, the actions uh, because now uh, there, there are uh, there is this move uh, there could be the uh, moves to kind of you know disperse the all the sisters by giving them transfers and things like that but uh, uh, police protection will continue uh, once the appeal has uh, been instituted uh, the police protection is going to continue and uh, uh, there has been assurances that they will not be separated all that has been there in the background but that we'll have to wait and see but uh, police protection will continue and the next step definitely, definitely for you all is to make the appeal in the high court i think should happen in another in a week or so in a week or so all right thank you so much sandhya for taking the time out uh, to break down this judgment for us absolutely shocking i think most of us who've been following the case were quite stunned uh when the verdict came out and uh, thanks to you for taking the time out to speak to us today all the news laundry podcasts are available on stitcher itunes and any other podcast platform please subscribe to news laundry help us keep news independent to catch all our podcasts on news pop culture current affairs and sport visit newslaundry.com follow us on facebook twitter and instagram and subscribe to our youtube channel